Yes, Great. Well, um, now my mic's off. There we go. Um, welcome to you all uh, again. Um, welcome to this uh, CFE uh, panel discussion on the challenges facing current vocational and skills policy and provision. And thank you all again for coming. Um, the importance of this discussion needs, of course, no explanation as we'll seek to make sense of the web of confusing arrangements currently being made for our future vocational and skills provision. Uh, and I'm sure, like me, you're looking forward to hearing from our expert panellists this evening uh, what they're making of it all. Uh, my name is James Croft, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, I'm the founder and now chair of the Centre for Education Economics, and as of last month, also editor of Education Investor magazine. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, host you this evening. So, a little bit about the Centre for Education Economics, or CFEE. Uh, CFEE is an independent uh, think tank working to improve policy and practice in education through impartial economic research. Uh, it exists essentially for the study of education reform, uh, to research and disseminate evidence addressed to how to improve the quality and efficiency of education services achieve optimal outcomes for young people and maximise the benefits of education to society as a whole. Uh, CFE monitors global research output in the economics of education. Uh, we produce a monthly and annual research digest uh, to disseminate this literature. Uh, well worth subscribing to, compiled by my colleague uh, Gabriel Heller-Salgren, who is our research uh, director. Uh, and we also market um, reports that we think deserve uh, greater public attention um, and bridge <coughs> economists we believe to be of a special relevance for policy. Uh, we publish books and in-depth policy studies uh, which in turn frame uh, our shorter reports and comment pieces on day-to-day -day education policy matters. And in support of this we run a variety of different stakeholder engagement projects to inform our research and engage the public in the policy debate, events like this one. Now we're delighted this evening to be partnering with VTCT, the Vocational Training Charity, a Charitable Trust, uh, a specialist awarding organisation for those that don't know it, offering vocational and technical qualifications uh, in a range of service sectors. Um, VTCT have been thought leaders in the vocational and training space recently, pressing government with us on the issues that matter for good policy and taking a number of initiatives themselves too. Shifting the focus from starts to completions uh, in our evaluation of apprenticeship program success, uh, working to join up the trail for young people with difficulties credentialising their learning and work experiences via a brilliant new scheme uh, they've devised with education technology firm Digital Assess called Skills Blockchain, well worth a look. Uh, and taking lead also with the Hair and Barber Council in informing Parliament of the value and diversity of the hair and beauty sector and the new range of career paths emerging in this space. So moving to our panel, uh, Ewart Keep, uh, who's going to be uh, presenting, uh, uh, kicking us off with his opening presentation this evening, is Chair in Education, Training and Skills at the Department for Education, University of Oxford and Director of Skills, Knowledge and Organisational Performance, uh, otherwise known as SCOPE. Uh, you'll find more about him in your programme there. Uh, Mark Daw um, deserves a special pat and thanks, uh, pat on the back and, uh, and thanks just, just for, seeing, for, seeing, uh, for, 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 for stepping, uh, stepping into the breach uh, at very late notice. There was a frantic uh, LinkedIn live messaging going on on Friday saying, come on Mark, <laughs> come through for me. And uh, he filled uh, a late opening space. I shan't name and shame the individual that let me down. Um, Gemma, uh, pleased to have you with us, is Head of Funding and Assessment at LSECT, which is the company that runs Schools Week and FE Week. Um, so, I'm not sure whether to thank you or not, really. No, seriously. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> no, 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 definitely, definitely, definitely. A, a welcome uh, advent to the um, media scene in, in education. Um, Tom 
Richmond has spent almost a decade working on education skills and welfare policy uh, and will be known to many of you uh, from his role as Senior Advisor to Skills Ministers Nick Bowles and Matthew Hancock between 2013 and 2015. So welcome all. Thank you very much. I always take too long on that. And uh, over to you. Thank you very much. OK, well, two quick health warnings. The first is um, we still live in an age of austerity, and you'll see that my slides, PowerPoint slides, are fairly austere in their layout. Um, no frills there. And secondly, I ought to um, offer, offer the very quick health warning that I am not an economist. Sorry, we let some of you in. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, <laughs> OK, I was told to do something that gave an overview of prospective policy challenges. I've got 20 minutes to do it, and I hope to do it in less. So, away we go. First thing that really worries me is that we've created a set of markets or quasi-markets, and yet we haven't come to terms with what we've done. It's really interesting. Civil servants still talk about um, system, system, and you think, no, no, we, we, that's what we had. Don't have that anymore. Um, and so I have a real fear that one of the problems we face is that we have a mixture of possibly the worst of markets and systems. We have markets, and then we have ministers who think that they can second-guess them or prod them or change them or play with them. Um, I think that's very dangerous. Uh, and in fact, I think that problem underlies quite a lot of what's going to follow. Markets have a very different underlying logic to systems. And at least in the short term, as markets adjust to different trends, to different demand, um, coherence and cohesion may not be one of those um, strengths. And I think that's a problem for policymakers because they actually like um, some level of coherence and cohesion. Uh, in terms of institutions and delivery mechanisms. And so I think one of my messages to policymakers is try and get to grips with the fact that the system that you had 20 years ago no longer exists. We are in a brave new world for good or ill, and that has its own set of logics. OK, the big picture. Well, plainly, marketization, greater contestability, a desire for new entrants. Uh, we have the Institutes of Technology and the National Colleges, and having seen the recent announcement about IOTs and the amount of money that's available, um, for those of you with long memories, it looks suspiciously like Cove's Centres <coughs> for Vocational Excellence. Uh, I'm not at all sure that the IOTs are going to be the great big shiny palaces that I think some people originally thought. Skills plan, I'll come back to that. Accidental reform of the student loan repayment threshold. I mean, accidental in the sense that I don't think anyone did the sums before it was announced, because the implications for repayment rates on FE loans are going to be absolutely astonishing. Um, taking the repayment threshold up to 25K uh, is not going to mean that too many uh, FE loans get even started to be repaid. Friendship reform and levy, we'll come back to that very briefly. Other members of the panel know more about it than I do. Devolution of the adult education budget and combined authority skills strategies. At the moment, Greater London Authority is busy trying to put together a skills strategy with very little intellectual and staffing resource to do it. The, st the, the population of London is 50% greater than the population of Scotland. Scotland has a national government with all the resources that come with that. GLA does not. And it is not an easy process, and I say that because I'm on the task and finish group that's supposed to be doing it. FE loans. Well, I'm very nervous about FE loans, particularly when they're being given out by providers. Uh, I think there's a genuine moral hazard problem there. And is there an overall strategy? Well, my answer would be no. I'm willing to be challenged on that. I'm willing for someone to reveal to me the secret strategy that has eluded um, you know, my observation, but I don't think there is an overall strategy for any of this. Recent history. We changed the world, and we often forget it. In 1979, 11% of the workforce had a degree, and 45% of the workforce had no qualifications whatsoever. Now, 38% of the workforce have a degree, and only 8% of the workforce have no qualifications. So that's a pretty profound change. Now, you can argue about what's in the box labelled degree, and you can argue what's in the box labelled qualification. But at a superficial level, we've made a massive change in the skills profile of our workforce. But 
what happened to productivity trend? Well, let's ignore it since 2008, because that's, that's a really complex story, which I don't think anyone really can fully explain. But what I suggest is that over the time that we've massively expanded higher education, massively expanded post-compulsory uh, participation, if the standard human capital theory had worked, that trend line should have gone like that. And it didn't. It didn't change one jot when you smooth the wiggles in it. So something that was supposed to happen didn't happen. And I think that really is quite a serious problem because there are structural issues that underlie it. Now, last week I was at the Shard for an event run by the OECD, <coughs> by their lead project around job quality and skills and the UK labour market. OECD's adult skills survey it was very clear. We have the second lowest demand from employers after Spain out of 22 countries uh, for workers educated beyond compulsory schooling. And that figure simply re replicates earlier evidence from EU surveys and <coughs> general trends that we've known for a long time that many British employers have relatively limited skill requirements in, as measured by qualifications or post-compulsory education compared to other countries. We know from the um, UK-wide National, uh, education, uh, National Employer Skills Survey that a lot of employers themselves recognise they have staff who've got skills that are not being used in the job that the employer has currently designed for them. PIAC again showed we have the second highest levels after Japan of apparent overqualification amongst workers. And the one that I still think is probably the most shocking piece of data I've seen in the last 15 years, long-term employment outcomes data for graduates. A decade after graduating, 25%, a whole quarter of graduates are not earning £20,000 a year. That means they haven't repaid a single penny of their student loan, and they probably never will. That is not a labour market transition problem. That would be two or three years out from graduating. Ten years out? That suggests something has gone very badly wrong. Now, I would argue, and I'm not sure that all of you would agree, but I would argue, and <coughs> the OECD would argue, and the Scottish Government would argue, and the Welsh Government would argue, that we have major problems with underlying levels of demand for skill in our economy, uh, and that um, supply is actually the easy bit. Uh, we may not be very good at supply, but if you're a minister and you can find some, some, some money down the back of the sofa, you can launch a new skills supply scheme. That's the easy bit. Making sure that those skills are then productively deployed in the workforce, within the productive process, to increase productivity and profitability, we know we're not terribly good at that. And there are some reasons why that is the case. And people who say, oh, well, the industrial strategy will solve that. Well, the new industrial strategy, the, one, the, you know, the next one after the green paper, may be very different from the green paper white strategy. But when you look at the number of workers covered by the original green paper strategy, it's 10% of the manufacturing workforce and therefore 1% of the entire employed workforce. So in and of itself, it ain't going to solve some of these problems. They've been around for a very long time. Role of employers, absolutely critical. Um, recently, a really interesting report was released by CIPD. They did some work for the JP Morgan Foundation, taking basic human resource management support and consultancy services to SMEs. <laughs> what the report says is that most, many of the SMEs that needed help hadn't even mastered the basics of legal employment contracts. They were often operating uh, outside the law. They had no strategic capacity to engage with even basic pay, pensions, remuneration, terms and conditions, working hours issues. The idea that they were in any fit state to deal with you know, developing their staff, uh, trying to uh, introduce apprenticeships, not a chance. So it's really worth reading that report because it reminds you what the reality is out there on the ground amongst many businesses. Institute of Employment Research have done a project, Precarious Pathways, which shows broadly similar problems about the way in which young people are entering the labour market through increasingly insecure employment. And the last 40 years has basically been about, about government saying, oh, employers want to own the skills agenda. 
and then being rather disappointed when actually rather a lot of them don't. The data we have suggests that employers have retreated from training large sections of their workforce. There's been a significant fall in the volume of training days. And it has to be said that the employer ownership pilots, which cost 200 million plus, show that you can make some progress, but only with coalitions of the willing. Vast proportions of employers are not particularly worried about this and are certainly not willing to do very much and are certainly not willing to get their wallets out and pay for very much. So <laughs> there is a real structural problem about what employers are willing to do. Wonderful report um, from the CBI in 2009. Uh, it's no longer on their website, sadly. Um, but it was a moment of supreme honesty and, and I actually give them marks for that. Um, that they were basically saying, well, look, in the future, our member firms are going to scale back all the non-essential stuff. It's going to be just in time, just enough training for just the number of employees that need it. And also, and I think this is where apprenticeship <coughs> collapses, though I think Mark will probably disagree with me, businesses, the CBI say, want to be an empowered consumer, not training providers themselves. If you showed that to a large Swiss employer, a large German employer, they'd scratch their heads. They don't see themselves as consumers. They are part of the system. They are the primary delivery agent for a large component of what apprenticeship is. And we have externalised training provision to a large extent uh, with, I think, some costs. Skills plan? Well, huge focus on 16 to 19. Adult skills went missing and is now just beginning to claw its way back onto the, onto the political stage. Uh, but I think that the skills plan has massive potential knock-on effects on post-19. But I don't think, I think the policy science is because I don't think anyone's actually realised uh, that if you have T-levels, what happens to all the adult qualifications? Are you going to make all the adults who want to retrain do a T-level? Or are you actually going to keep the existing suite of qualifications and use those for adults? Who knows? Is policy development missing some of the issues? Well, that's a rhetorical question, uh, because I think they are, particularly in the skills plan, around curriculum, which is, is rather invisible, and pedagogy, which is completely invisible. How this is actually going to be taught? Most evidence suggests that good vocational education has a distinctive pedagogy. It's not taught if you want it to be successful in the same way as you would teach an A-level. Have policymakers yet wrapped their heads around that one? I don't think so. Do policymakers understand other countries' mode B tertiary systems? No. And in fact, pleasingly, DfE last week announced that they are going to do a inquiry into level four and five provision because they realise, or it's finally dawned on them, uh, that Alison Wolf was completely right earlier this year in remaking tertiary education. Most other developed countries have specialist vocational institutions that deliver sub high quality sub degree level provision, and we don't on the whole. And that's an enormous problem. And also, because of the way we fund things, everything has to be done by the age of 19 in our system, because after that, loans kick in. There's no more public, direct public funding for anything. So I think there's a tertiary spaced hole in our skills plan system. Um, most FE, actually when you look at 16 to 19, particularly in, in certain colleges in certain parts of the country, is at levels one and two, not even at three. It's certainly not at four and five. I think it will be very interesting to see what the level four and five inquiry makes of all this, though as the chair of the inquiry and its terms of reference have not yet been announced, I reserve judgment on how thorough and useful an exercise <laughs> this will prove to be. Uh, let's wait and see. But I am very clear that a sub-degree tier ought to be on the table for discussion. We have far too many people doing three year full-time honours, bachelor's degrees, and not enough people doing high-quality sub-degree provision. It's also very clear to me, when you look at the FE figures, a lot of our, our upper secondary phase is actually spent remediating uh, earlier failures. That's a huge problem. 
Uh, but basically, large numbers of kids get thrown out of school, down, sent down to the FE college or to private provider, and then spend uh, the next uh, year or so trying to get that first level two, which they should have got in the first um, phase of their education, but didn't. Now, the skills plan is very um, silent about all this. It just has this strange empty vacuum-shaped box that's called the transition year, into which all these um, yeah, unfortunate children who are not going to be doing a T-level will be placed. And what happens to them once they're in that space is not tremendously clear, and what it will lead to is not tremendously clear. My centres and, and others have done quite a lot of work on pathways, and I think the problem with skills plan is that most of the pathway talk is about pathways in education. Yeah, that's great, but they have to be mirrored by progression pathways and skill ladders inside the workplace, or they're not going to go very far. Uh, one of the lessons from actually studying labour markets and, and progression pathways is that in a lot of organisations, they are actually going to be horizontal pathways rather than vertical. We endlessly think of progression up a ladder, one, two, three, four, five. Often that's not how firms deploy their workforce. They want to develop them. They develop them laterally by broadening their skills or shifting them into a new area of work. So we really have to think very hard about that. And we also know that in a lot of occupations, the ladders, particularly vertical ladders, career progression opportunities, are often very short. They have one or two rungs. And my centre uh, produced a really interesting paper that was written by Gary Morris. Gary used to be the head of the Army's Education and Training Command. Uh, and I, I take a look at the paper. It's on our website. Well worth the read. Our UK Commission did a lot of work on progression pathways. NCVR in Australia have done a huge piece of really high quality research on vocational families and pathways. Both indicate if you want vocational pathways to work in the education system, they have to be rooted in some reality in the labour market and with employment. It doesn't seem an enormous intuitive leap to work that out, but it's one that policymakers tend to like to ignore. They just create the pathway in education and assume that there is a counterpart out there in um, the labour market. And sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're not. Ah. This is a very difficult one. Um, origin, originally, the uh, skills plan said that the apprenticeship standards were going to be incorporated into the T-level 15 routes. Well, that'll be interesting. Um, many of the apprenticeship standards are very job-specific. My favourite is still mineral waybridge operator. I, I show that to overseas countries that have got proper apprenticeship systems, and they laugh because they say, that, that's a job, that's an entry-level dead-end job. I mean, you're going to learn to run a waybridge, great, but that's not an apprenticeship. And many contain no qualification, which I think could be a bit of a stumbling block of integrating them into the T-level route, but who knows? <clears throat> employers. Are employers going to play ball? Many employers got their fingers burnt with the diplomas, with the revision of the National Occupational Standards that the <coughs> government subsequently um, decided to walk away from. Uh, quite a lot of them were involved in the UK Commission and Sector Skills Councils, and when that got closed down, um, they got quite grumpy. And I am not sure that they are going to be piling into um, the skills plan in quite the way that the government hopes and expects. Choices at age 16. Okay, that, that little lot's simple. That's the bit that really worries me. <coughs> what does the transition year move you on to? Level 3 tech pathway? Not really, I suspect. Traineeship? Maybe, but we don't have many traineeships. Apprenticeship le level 2? Well, at the moment the levy suggests that those are going to be falling for young people, but we'll see. Informal on the job training, job with no training, or neathood. And that is the thing to bear in mind, because the, st st the statistics already tell us that will be the case. In many colleges, say, go to Middlesbrough, more kids will be on the transition year than they will be on the T-levels, guaranteed. Impacts on adult education, who knows? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows at the moment, but I think it's going to be really exciting uh, to see what policymakers make of what the skills plan for 16 to 19 does to provision beyond, beyond 19. Post-19 loans. Well, it's interesting, when you actually look at the figures, what's driving the current take-up of loans is really clear. It's license to practice requirements. You look at the breakdowns, gas fitters, accountancy, early years, health and social care, and fitness <laughs> trainers, because if you want to be a personal fitness trainer, you need the level three to get your insurance. 
It's going to be very interesting to see what the long-term effect of post-19 loans is likely to be. But I think the interesting thing is, with the repayment threshold having gone up to 25k, if you were an economically rational worker, you could calculate relatively easily whether you're ever going to have to repay a single penny of this loan. And for a lot of workers, particularly in health and social care, I can guarantee that you won't. So perhaps the students, prospective students, will wise up. Why do lifelong learning? It's just gone. Except for the Government Office for Science Foresight project, which I don't suppose many of you have seen, but it's on their website. They did a huge project on adult learning and um, the changing nature of the labour market. I'd really recommend you look at some of the briefing papers from that exercise, because they're really helpful in clarifying some of the figures and issues around adult learning. Quality control, who leads? Well, that, again, is a question to which I have no answer. And it's not clear to me that the people who are running those institutions have an answer either. They probably have different answers, but whether the four answers that would come would actually add up to the same answer as anyone else has got, I doubt. So I'm looking forward to the Game of Thrones uh, in the episode where they fight it out. Um, because they have got very different views about what all this is about. Apprenticeships, I'm not going to say any. The one thing I will say about apprenticeship is the minister was apparently claimed that she was flabbergasted that a large proportion of employers did not know about the levy. Why was she flabbergasted? What, what were her civil servants telling her? Because it was deeply predictable. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's very odd. I mean, it worries me that the people, if you like, the person that's piloting the plane doesn't seem to know whether it has any wings or not. I find that, that really worrying. Adult education devolution, well, very slow pace, loss of momentum, major capacity <coughs> issues. A lot of local authorities are wasting their time <coughs> obsessing about getting control of schools, which seems to me to be insane of them. Uh, the adult education budget is the money they're going to get, so they need to work out what the hell to do with it. And the calls on the funds will wildly exceed the amount of money available. And the new commissioning system hasn't exactly got off to a sparkling start. <coughs> And finally, almost finally, Conservative Manifesto promised a national retraining scheme. Meaning what? Unknown. Labour Manifesto promised a national education service to mirror the NHS. Meaning what? <laughs> Completely unclear. <laughs> national, so what happens to devolution if it's all going to be national? Funding, to come from where? Implications, almost completely unknown. So on the adult side of the business, massive uncertainty and a massive lack of plans and yet the retraining needs and reskilling needs of our adult working population over the next 20 years are going to be phenomenally large and we seem to just think that if we can get everything sorted up by the age of 19 that will somehow do it no it won't so there we are that's my quick canter through it i stuck to my 20 minutes and um good luck to the others <laughs> thank you So you can imagine having a look at those slides beforehand and thinking, how on earth can I say anything coherent looking at those slides? So a web of confusing policies and a web of confusing uh, comments, I think. Um, I was an economist at university and an accountant. I don't know where that puts me in all of that. Um, and over the last 40, these 48 hours, I've been speaking to business schools, careers providers. I've got nursery world tomorrow. Um, and this. So apologies if I sort of drift off and things. And I am going to speak and leg it, I'm afraid. So, uh, uh, so there is no overarching careers, uh, skills, yeah, careers, skills strategy. There isn't. There's lots of bits. There's nothing overarching. And that's one of the things we're saying is needed. Um, I do believe that a market system is the best, but you'll always get imperfect markets. And where there are imperfect markets, that's where you need interventions. Um, you can look at the £280 million underspent in adult education budget that's not a market system um, where there's enormous need. There's something wrong there. So I'm a great believer in market systems but with the appropriate intervention and guidance where necessary. Uh, and there are two pillars uh, to policy at the moment which is social mobility and productivity. Productivity is uh, industrial strategy, whatever you want to call it. 
Um, what I would say is there's a lot of rhetoric around social mobility, but it's been totally abandoned. We are less socially mobile at the moment than we used to be, and a lot of the policies are pushing even further away. You see the T levels moving to level three. Let's forget the level twos. You see criticism of level two apprenticeships all the time. They're, they're not proper apprenticeships. They're not proper training. The level four, five, six stuff's the important stuff. You see the English and maths disaster in this country. It, we are abandoning those that most need it, and we're abandoning policies to support those that most need it. Um, lots of talk always about other systems. Just talk to Tim about Finland and, and actually Germany as well. Uh, and it's the social context, it's the history uh, of these systems. It's no point just looking at them now. It is what's the social context, what is the history, where have they come from. Uh, in world skills we beat Germany which was great, that was the only thing we cared about. Um, uh, but, you know, actually the, the, the thing about world skills, uh, which just happened in Abu Dhabi, uh, was that it was the Koreans, it was the Chinese, um, it was the Japanese, they were winning all the high-tech stuff, they were winning all the engineering stuff. It wasn't the Germans, it wasn't the Europeans. So we need to change our, our sights and where we look and what's going on. Now, some of it is because the Koreans, I think, if they win gold, they get a house. You know, there's a bit of an incentive there. We, we just give, um, we, if they're lucky, they go to number 10 in this country. Um, but, but there is, underlyingly, there is a focus in these, in, these, uh, in these sectors. The Koreans have 836 standards. Um, they showed me on their computer, but I didn't understand a word of it because uh, it was all in Korean. But they, you know, they have that. It's all available. Uh, they're, they're sort of further advanced in, in terms of developing standards for, for their industry. So again, sorry about jumping around. We're talking about three pathways, uh, academic, classroom-based, vocational, and apprenticeships. Um, I'm wondering how a, just a level 3T level can be a pathway. It doesn't feel like a pathway to me. It seems like a, 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 well, a thing. Um, so, you know, what's going on there? What is actually going on in the classroom? I see T levels getting smaller and smaller. A tiny and tiny group of uh, learners is becoming elitist again. This drift up. Actually, what counts is at level 3 and the learners that can lead level 3. Let's forget the foundation to Let's forget... Uh, level two that you know they'll come through somehow through some transition it's all it'll all be fine uh, so there's there's a real issue there I think um, what else <clears throat> to me the whole thing is very simple you've got different elements you've got the curriculum level two to level seven and and that shouldn't be political it should be what is needed it should be driven or guided by the employers it should be gathered um, then there's the assessment uh, and if the development of apprentice standards and assessment tells us anything, it is don't give non-assessment experts the job of designing assessment. Uh, you look at the assessments that are in apprenticeship standards, some of them are appalling uh, and, and it needs to be sorted. How can a level three dental nurse be assessed by an essay in an interview? You know, that's it. So people stuffing their hands in your mouth in the future will have talked about it very eloquently <laughs> and written about it. But that is the assessment. Now, there, there is a whole range there. And there are little things and big things, but there is a real issue there. Um, assessment, um, and I would say this, wouldn't I, from you know, some of my background, but it requires real expertise. And we're not applying that at the moment. Then there's the delivery. Uh, pedagogy, I mean at least um, we know that we've all got to teach phonics so that's been made very clear to us uh, even to bricklayers and hairdressers um, uh, you know, it's really important um, and, and, you know, and then funding, now there are clear roles, the I, in the apprenticeship world the IFA is going to hold the standards and um, the assessment don't ever mention off to the IFA by the way, um, you get shouted down, we're not off qual we do it different, um, delivery uh, that's, that's that's checked by Ofsted, um, or is it the IFA? Um, you know, or, or who, who is responsible uh, for quality here? They said you missed uh, one key part on, uh, on uh, quality, actually. Uh, so you'd think the ESFA is just funding, wouldn't you? It's in the name, Skills, Education mm -hmm. Skills Funding Agency. <coughs> the amount of audit they do around delivery and quasi-quality checks has more influence on the way people deliver and what they do than Ofsted in many cases. So ESFA needs to lay off doing that stuff. It should be left to the, again, the experts, not a bunch of auditors who don't know what they're looking at. 
Um, so that's a little counter through there. Um, apprenticeships, uh, I think apprenticeships are a game changer. Um, they really, it, it's bizarre actually, isn't it? You look at what's been put up around T levels now, um, it doesn't half look like an apprenticeship framework, uh, a qualification, um, some work experience in English and maths. Wasn't that what an apprenticeship framework was? And that's going to be the way forward. And that's what we've just abandoned in the apprenticeship world. And we're going to bring them together and make them look the same again. Uh, uh, bets on what that's going to look like. So, you know, there's strange things going on there, but actually there, it is a real game changer. The levy payers, over 50% rather than 15% of uh, large companies are now registered to deliver apprenticeship work and actually have apprentices. That's massive. That's a massive change. Um, it involves more teaching than assessing. That's a good change as well. And actually, the employers are part of the delivery now. They are getting involved in the delivery. Again, I believe in a partnership because actually what the employers need is protection from Ofsted and the SFA. And those that can protect them are the providers that get a kicking all the time. So why not get a kicking on behalf of the employers as well? But, they, you know, that partnership, they deal with the bureaucracy. The employers can help with the delivery. That, to me, works really well. And I think we'll see lots of people, lots of employers going onto the apprenticeship register, not because they want to deliver on their own, but they want to deliver it in partnership with providers. And that's the way to go. And I, many of the events um, I've been talking at, we've had lots of apprentices talking, particularly higher apprentices, and it is fantastic. Um, the one I was at yesterday, um, he said, uh, <laughs> He said, I go out with my mates from university, they all have pot noodles and I can have pizza. Because right? he's been paid and they're all worried about their debt. Um, getting on with his life and actually the, the greatest stories are when these apprentices, who are often level four, level five, are saying, and then all the graduates come in and I'm managing them because they don't have a clue what they're meant to do. Right? There, there, is a, there is a need for both. But I think we're going to get a massive rebalance about where higher education happens. A lot of the sectors are saying this is fantastic. At last, we can get to those young people at 18 and help guide them, give them experience as well as the degree. We'll support them through their degree as well. And you listen to these apprentices. They're so, so happy that they're in work and learning in work as well as, and the employers love it as well. The employers love their input. So I've said right from the beginning, at least half the levy will go on higher and degree apprenticeships. Absolutely. The only thing stopping it at the moment is the IFA and the painful process you have to go through to get standards and, uh, and EPA's uh, assessment approved. That's the only thing stopping these universities. There are 88 on the register with another bunch ready to come through in the latest uh, register. So actually, watch the levy disappear but watch it disappear on four, five, and six, and seven. You know, you can do a management degree. I, I'm an organization of 22. We have three young apprentices, events, uh, digital marketing, administration. I've told our accounting staff, do your AAT apprenticeship. Yeah? I can get 90% funding for that, rather than you having to pay for your qualification. I've told my senior team, go off and do an MBA if you want, because at the moment, I can get 90% funding. I could have nine, ten apprentices in my organisation of 22, and as others start to see that, whether they're a levy payer or not, we're going to see a mass move, but it will be the higher stuff, and once again, we're going to be abandoning the level twos and the level threes that need the support the most. In fact, half of HE, I reckon, if you look at the 50% that go to HE, probably half would be better off doing some form of blended approach or apprenticeship approach. And when you start looking at the LEO data, uh, the LEO data for non-Russell Group graduates, if you compare that to level five apprenticeships, they're pretty much the same earning potential. And that's before all these other degree apprenticeships are coming through. So I think very quickly, parents, young people, let alone the debt and the payment of working while you're earning and actually having a job at the end of it, the whole information around what the potential is will be enormous. I'm afraid I think the colleges have missed the boat on four and five. It's been 25 years since incorporation, 25 years since the polys have gone off to try and be Russell Group universities. They've realised that's not going to work. They're starting to look at apprenticeships. They're starting to look at level four, five. Some are dropping down to level three as well. The college has had 25 years to fill that space uh, and, and they've missed it. Now, I think part of the reason they missed it is because the universities kept offering everyone level six. 
So how, as sitting in a college, especially when I was a principal, trying to persuade someone they'd be better off doing a level four technical program rather than going down to Hertfordshire University down the road and doing a level six, really, really hard. Um, again, I think this is going to shift. Last, last few points. Um, the, uh, we're not starting in a great place, are we? You know, I, 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 the FE gets blamed for everything. You get, what is it, 40% of learners coming out every year without English and maths grade C. And then FE are blamed for not sorting out within a year. Um, so, you know, 10 years, uh, schools get it wrong, but let's blame FE for the problem. The adult stock is phenomenal. The adult stock on, on, on poor literacy and numeracy, uh, having been involved in Skills for Life in, in the early 2000s, we made enormous shifts. It's all gone back. No, it's been abandoned, it's all gone back. We have a real problem to deal with. Um, so I've talked about HE using up the levy. I think social mobility, young people are losing out at the moment on the skills strategy. Uh, SMEs are being uh, forced out of apprenticeships. They have to pay 10%. Everyone said, oh, 10%, that's nothing. When you're a small business, with all the challenges you're facing, 10% is a lot. When you're a small business taking on someone that actually needs breakfast in the morning, needs support because they're, they're not getting any parental support, uh, needs, needs their staff to support them through the training. And then you're saying, oh, and by the way, thanks for all that help, and you're gonna pay 10%. They're saying, go away. In many sectors, they're saying, go away. And that is working against the very people who need that support. If the apprentice needs maths and English, uh, it's, it's even more effort for the provider and the employer. Why would you take on someone without their maths and English when you can take on an adult with it all, with loads of experience and can drive a car as well? You know, so the, the pressure is away um, from those uh, level, uh, so the, the, the focus is moving further and further away from the level two and level three learners. Devolution, I think we have to maintain a national entitlement but allow local flexibility to stimulate those areas that the local area needs. So they can facilitate, they can help. Um, so it's a mixture of the two. Um, and, and again, just on literacy and numeracy, I think, you know, how many, how many people, how many arguments do we have to have about the, the uh, GCSE reset policy until someone realises it is diabolical? Um, it is... It is it is mass failure. It is encouraging mass failure. The system is designed for the less able to fail. It's, it's how the system is set up. And what it feels to me is like we keep on kicking the disadvantaged to keep them in their place rather than doing something that will actually motivate them and encourage them to develop. So, again, that policy, if nothing else, should change tomorrow. And I've had plenty of arguments with Nick Gibb about it. I've talked to um, Anne Milton about it. It is something where we can still support those that could be getting their GCSE. You know, a bit of initial assessment. Half of you maybe get the GCSE. The other half we need to support in a different way. But to force them all through that system is just terrible. It's terrible education and it's terrible for those young people. There you go. There's a little rant. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Right. I'll leave you with that. Uh, why don't you come over here? Okay. And um, so. I think Tom's nominating me to go next. Are you? <laughs> Do you want to decide between you? Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come along and speak this evening. Um, you were fascinating as ever. Uh, thank you. I. You talked a lot about skills ban. I'd like to talk about apprenticeships because I spent uh, two years working as an advisor to ministers at the Department of Education working on the apprenticeship reforms. And whenever I look at the skills plan, I just can't help thinking about the apprenticeship reforms. Look, go back to apprenticeship, go back to 2012. They started with a great idea. I don't think there's any doubt at all that they really had a very clear idea of what they wanted to do and they went about trying to execute it. Good. Number two, they had a genuine problem they were trying to solve. Um, I think you look at the, the quality of the frameworks and say, at the very least, I think the kindest thing you could say, that they were variable in terms of quality. There were some good ones and some incredibly weak ones. The money was not going to the right places. Employers weren't really engaged in the system. There was a genuine problem that needed to be solved. So I thought, okay, good opportunity to solve it. 
Number three, there was ministerial backing for the government apprenticeship forms. Uh, Michael Gove appointed me to support him as ministers. Matthew Hancock, uh, as any of you who, who've met him will know, he's an absolute whirlwind of energy. There was genuine, genuine support right at the top of government from David Cameron as well. We want to make this happen. And then fourth and finally, there was a sense of optimism about it as well. You had employers who wanted to come and sit around the table. You didn't have to cajole them, you didn't have to strong arm them in there. They wanted to come and sit around the table. They wanted to get involved. They wanted to take more ownership of the system. And so when I got offered the job, I couldn't resist it. I wanted to get stuck in. Two years later, I walked away with my head in my hands. So what about T-Level? What I see when I see the skills plan, when I see T-Levels, what do I think now? Number one. It's, there is a great idea, there is a nugget, just like with apprenticeship reforms, of a really good idea in there. Definitely, I still believe that now. Number two, there's a genuine problem that needs to be solved. The system is very confusing for young people. I work at Sixth Form College now. It's very, very hard. I, I've worked and stuff in government. I find it very hard to explain to people <laughs> what the current system is. And when they say, Tom, should I do this? I, I actually would have to go away and try and find out the answer before I even... It's really very hard. And so when people talk about you know, the lack of careers advice and career strategy, I would never expect my colleagues to know what's going on. And I worked in, in government, so I really couldn't expect them to know an awful lot more. There is a general, there's still some low quality courses um, in the system. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw my TES article recently saying, well, I think there has been a lot of progress with tech levels, remember them? <laughs> Only about 18 months ago, so they're old history now, um, of course. Um, but they, they had done a huge narrowing down process to get rid of a lot of the ports, set a very high quality bar, strip out the rest. There, a lot of progress has been made, but there still is some work that needs to be done. So great, there's a genuine problem there. There's ministerial backing. I've heard it said more than once that technical education reforms is just ingredients. Number one priority. I've never really got the sense was that into grammar schools. That could be my interpretation, but it certainly is her priority now. So you've got all of the ingredients and there's optimism as well. There's a lot of employers who want to come and sit around the table and employer groups who want to come and sit around the table. So I look at these two and think I see a lot of similarity between them. But for those of you who read my policy exchange report last year about where the government apprenticeship reforms have ended up, they've ended up, I think, in a very, very, very bad place and it's not getting any better. The standards development is still out of control. By a very small C conservative estimate, I'd say 40 to 50% of the standards are not even apprenticeships. There's so little uh, quality training in there. Um, on assessments, it was the only slide of you that I disagree with because you thought there might be a, a Game of Thrones face-off between those organisations. I think they'll all just walk away. I don't think there'll be any battle at all. When something goes wrong, I think they'll say nothing to do with me. I'm off court. That, that was I fed, I'm off court. Offset said, we're just inspecting training. It's definitely them. Uh, you know, I can just see that happening now. Everyone's been pointing fingers at everyone else. I don't think there'll be any Game of Thrones at all. They could be opposite of Game of Thrones. What is, what is the opposite? They don't want to sit there. To, I, I, I can't imagine what's going to happen. And on funding, well, when you see the FT reporting, we've already got companies that's using the levy for paying for senior executives to go on to MBAs, you know this. It, it was predicted by me and many others, and it was predictable. And you still got a bit of a head in the sand approach. I mean, the Treasury is still obviously delighted about the whole thing. The less employers spend, the more money they get. But the employers are wising up and they're not behaving in the way that you'd really want them to do. And as Mark said, we're trying to get young people into the labour market. I don't think that's the only thing apprenticeships should do, but there is a core of what they should be doing, and I don't think putting senior executives onto MBAs really solves that problem. So, my point is very simply, we have been down this road before. We are still, in fact, going down this road with the apprenticeship reforms. We have not got it right at all on the apprenticeship reforms, and it's still veering off wildly in one direction. I cannot help but feel there'll be another review in a few years' time. The apprenticeship reforms already need another review to slam on the brakes, probably tear it all up and start all over again because that's the only way that ministers know how. I think I look at where the skills plan is and the, the tech and, and the T level sorry, and I think <coughs> there is a nugget of a good idea, but I can already see it just very slightly starting to it's just drifting at the moment. It's not veering off yet, it's drifting in the wrong direction. And all it takes is a, um, a few uh, civil servants to say to a minister, everything's fine, let's go for it. And when they did, as we did with the apprentices, push too hard, too fast, without the infrastructure they needed in place. I feel we're going to end up even we we will get the first ones off the ground I, when ministers want something to happen it will happen we will see the first uh, t levels before 20 uh, 2022 election as you know that is the next election uh, rather than tomorrow but um <laughs> we will see some i guarantee just like with diplomas we will get something but someone else would come along either a new prime minister of the same political party or a different political party and say nah don't like this let's do something else 
I don't want us to go down this road again. We are going this, down this road again at this moment in time. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to say anything entirely too different to what um, we've already heard tonight, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I'm less optimistic than Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I, I read the skills plan last summer, um, the night before it came out, because um, my now boss, Nick Linford, gave me a copy of it on embargo so I could read it early. And I read it and I said, it looks like a diploma. Except it looks like a diploma with no money. And we waste an awful lot of money on the diploma. Um, in, uh, you had slide earlier about um, incredibly specific friendship standards. There are even more than Mineral Weybridge operator. There's the electronic door opening apprenticeship as well. I'm, I'm not kidding. I really wish I was. There are three kinds of welding apprenticeships. There's a level two welder, a level three welder, and then there's a different one for nuclear welding. Who knew there were so many different types of welding? But there is. Um, last year, IPPR did a report on England's apprenticeship system, and the fa my favourite line from their report was in the foreword, where it said that England is in danger of introducing an apprenticeship system that would work well in the economy of the 1960s, but is not fit for a 21st century workforce. I read it and I shouted, here, here. I agree. But creating um, an apprenticeship system that is incredibly job-specific, not occupation-specific, it does not support um, transition into the workforce, or even really progression in the workforce. It's about training for a very specific job when you've got a uh, deputy director in the uh, education skills funding agency using the ESFA's levy money uh, to do their own chartered manager degree apprenticeship you realize that there's probably something wrong here T levels T levels are going to create silos you have a choice you have an academic choice or a technical choice I don't believe that the choice is that binary I think the system is much more complicated um, I think the labour market is much more complicated than that simple choice. I mean, 60% of higher education is already vocational. I mean, what is medicine or, or law? Um, has anybody taken a look at those occupational routes through that? Are we going to replace those completely by tech T levels? I doubt it. Um, my reading of, of where these reforms are coming from is to make things look more like an A level, to make things look more like things that the people that have written this report understand because they're the things that they have done. In theory, as um, a member of a political party and um, a student who did her um, good GCSEs, um, who did her facilitating subjects at A-level, who went to a Russell Group University, I should be the perfect advocate for why this system works, except it doesn't. I got a degree, um, because that's what I was told I had to do next. Um, my, the first job I took didn't require me to have that degree. I've got a degree in politics. I sort of play around in this area, but I'm not a, 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 um, employed in politics. Um, I only had to pay three grand to do that. I didn't have to pay nine grand. I did, didn't matter to me so much that I was making a binary choice between um, a more occupational choice or an academic choice. I wasn't ready to make that decision at 18. Yet, the problem we've got with the skills plans, we're asking people to make that choice at 16. Do you want to do this or that? I couldn't tell you now what I want to be when I grow up. And I'm <laughs> fairly certain um, that there's an awful lot of people that are in the very same position. Did anybody plan to get to the job that they're in currently? Um, I'm not even sure that I could advise somebody to get to the job that I'm now in, even if I wanted to go back and to tell them uh, what they needed to do. We've got this incredibly rigid programme with the skills plan of routes and pathways within it and here are the job roles that sit under these there's an occupational map that describes how these things are if i take a look at one of them and i've i've, I've seen a couple now um digital one is is often used um at, at events i can't translate those into the labor market i don't understand i don't imagine that there's a business in this country that would replicate anything that's in those occupational maps if i take a look at any large company they have hr departments finance departments they've got accountants they've got um, maybe engineers. I'm fairly sure BAE Systems has you know, more than one sort of occupation within it. And yet, in these tech level routes, we're creating these very rigid structures that suggest that you are this or that. When actually, the truth is that things are an awful lot closer than um, we expect them to be. I have a huge problem with this concept of employer ownership and let's put employers in charge. If employers had perfect foresight, no company would ever go bust. They don't. 
they have not got the capacity or the understanding or the ability to be able to create systems or qualifications or frameworks or standards. It's not what they do in their business. Maybe you know, they ought to speak to some of those organisations whose business it is to create those things. And looking at those things and looking at our labour market, 99.3% of businesses in the UK are small. 99.9% are SME. We've got a system that is designed by large employers for large employers. And it doesn't really reflect the 60% of the workforce that actually work in something that isn't a large employer. Uh, a year, oh, probably about 18 months ago now, um, in my last year at OCR, OCR worked with um, a company, a think tank called Think Global, on a report which we naively titled Turbulent Times. Um, it, that was even before the referendum. Um, it became incredibly true after uh, the referendum. Um, but the, there, were, there were three findings. One, the skills gap still exists, which I don't think is surprising. But they were especially around literacy and numeracy. Um, you know, and that is a different thing to English and maths. GCSE and literacy and numeracy are necessarily the same thing. Uh, the th second finding was that there more needs to be done to bring um, people together to understand what needs to be done next. And the third finding, which was my favourite, and it was me being a little bit uh, provocative, employers are out of touch. The employers that we surveyed, around 500 or so, um, with a predominant focus on small, um, uh, smaller micro businesses, because um, they often don't get heard, um, they had no understanding or recognition of the reforms that were happening. Um, the young people that might be wanting to enter their occupations, what their motivations were or changes, um, what their requirements would be in looking in, 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 in work. And 99.9% of them didn't know anything about the levy. Didn't know anything about the levy or what the implications of that were. We've got a predominance in our um, political system for regime, re regime change. We like doing it. I described to the deputy director um, at the DfE that's responsible for this policy um, that they're playing with the easy stuff in the skills plan by working on T-levels. Um, and I'm, I'm doing this a disservice because reforming qualifications is actually incredibly hard. And I speak as somebody who spent a decade working in that area. I know it's incredibly difficult, but actually it's incredibly difficult, but it's also incredibly easy because it's tangible and you can do it and you can set some parameters and you can make some people do some work and you can create a product at the end of it. The problem we've got is that doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the pedagogy or the curriculum. It doesn't change what's taught in those locations and ultimately it doesn't actually create more productive employees at the end of it. Uh, we've also got a problem about language. So uh, Youth Employment UK did an employability re review um, in the last six months and they looked at those soft skills, and I use them in inverted commas, so I don't think they're soft, those employability skills, transferable skills, personal learning and thinking skills, if we want to go back to diploma labels. Um, and they reviewed um, 86 different reports that talked about the need for soft skills. And in those 86 reports, they all used different words to describe what those skills are. If we can't even agree on what those things are that enable people to look you in the eye, to be able to hold a conversation, to do a presentation at work, to speak to their colleagues, to be professional, then how do we fix the rest of it? We know qualifications have value, yet everything we get being told are, is that these qualifications don't work, um, they're not right. The analysis that was done on the skills plan, um, analysis, um, was done on out-of-date out of information. The simple fact is that the qualifications landscape has changed in the last five years because of the implications of Alison Walsh's review. We've created tech levels and applied generals. Those qualifications are in their infancy. We have no idea yet what the impact is going to be of those changes, and yet we're already going to throw them out. These poor kids that are going to be the ones in 2022 that do the T levels for the first time are the poor kids who are going to be sitting new GCSEs in their, in their relatively early age, they're sitting new A-levels in relatively early states, but they're also the poor kids who had to sit new national curriculum assessments as well. When we get to the end of it, if they are more productive, more employable, easier to enter the workforce, which one worked? Did any of it work or was it you know, just the fact that the economy started growing and we need to employ more people <coughs> and there's actually jobs available for all of them? I think we've got four big problems from the skills plan. We've talked about some of them already, but I'll give you them all. The transition year, um, A, it's not a year. Um, transition <laughs> is a really horrible name, but you know, in the past we've called it foundation learning, foundation learning tier, um, entry in level one. 
We like labelling things, um, is the conclusion. It needs a proper review. What is it? What works? How do we get people to the next step? What is that next step? How do we determine for each person what that step is and how do we best support them to get there? How do we stop this permutation of low levels of skills? Because in doing that, that's how we fix the level four or five problem. Because actually, if you get people to this stage and then invest in them, you can get them to do the level four or five stuff. The problem we've got now is we've not got enough people going into there. If we do create this system, which I think we'll do, because all the reasons Tom said about political focus and it's the minister's big priority, we'll do it. We also need to fix bridging provision. So if we're going to create two silos, academic and vocational, we need to be able to support those people who pick the wrong option. And we need to make sure that they don't get stuck. And that's a problem we have now. Um, if you don't do A-levels, where, where do you go to next? How do you get into a really technical occupation if you've got a very academic um, set of qualifications? Higher level technical is our biggest problem. We don't have a system. It doesn't exist. We've hollowed out what we did have. Um, we've got huge skills gaps. Um, and, but they're not just skills gaps about young people. We've got to stop. In a, in a way, we're obsessing of this 18, 19-year-old age group. But actually, what about the 45-year-old retrainer? Because the, the steel industry is closing down. We need to be able to fix those things as well. And that's higher level technical. That's about how we support progression. That's about how we, uh, we solve the problem of a retiring workforce. And the last one is, is a difficult one. Um, it's IAG. Um, but I'm not convinced that there is a nirvana around careers guidance that we're just waiting to get around the corner to. Let's be realistic. There's nobody that you can have a conversation with that's going to know every possible job that is available and to be able to tell you which one's the right one for you. All they can do is help you make an informed choice about your next step. Um, I, I read the title of um, the skills minister's speech to the uh, careers uh, guidance uh, session today, and it said something along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing probably, um, that careers guidance helps, make pe helps people make informed choices. Well, great. If that's as far as we've got in skills, skills um, career strategy, then we've solved the problem, haven't we? If you get some guidance, you make a better choice. Yes, but it's about enabling people to get that guidance when you don't have a careers workforce. It's about providing the information for people to know where to get those choices, uh, where to make those choices. Because it's only if you have those things in place that people can make informed choices about going into technical pathways or apprenticeships or knowing what the implications of those things are. And maybe then we'll have less of a graduate underemployment problem because actually we'll be fixing some of those gaps in jobs that are available now. Thank you. Very good. Gosh. Um, I don't know about uni, but I hardly know where to start. Um, let's hear from you all. Jonathan and then Rafe. Huge congratulations to all of you. I think it's the first time for many, many months that I've been to a discussion group where Brexit was not mentioned once. Oh, I am yeah. <laughs> of the of my heart. How you managed to do it, I don't know. Um, uh, I normally at these events am the despondent, depressed one. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's wonderful. I engage with the Department for Education quite extensively and local authorities all around the country uh, on particularly special educational needs. The one thing you didn't mention which actually seems superfluous is talking about supported apprenticeships and su supported yeah. internships. Because OMG, the, the, the mainstream is in such a mess, how do you start doing that? Mm -hmm. And I have a, a son who did a level two and level three instead of A levels, managed to get into university to do a degree in education. And what do you do with a degree in education? You go into financial services, which he's just started. And I have a daughter who, who has just finished an apprenticeship, which uh, uh, was appalling, except it did get her a full-time job, which she started three weeks ago. But that was despite the system. There was no training. I looked at the, the, the apprenticeship work that the, the um, sub subcontracted company w was doing, and it was pathetic. So essentially, Thank you for reala realising I'm not the most despondent person around here. Uh, and I will now go and slip my wrist. <laughs> Ray. Uh, Ray. And then right. Carol. So you three are the Minister for Skills tomorrow. 
and you're allowed to, not allowed to change legislation at all, mm -hmm. but you can do two things to make things better. What are they? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, let's have Charlotte's question and then Carol's comment, and then we'll have some answers. Hi, I'm Charlotte Davis from Fit to Learn, a Croydon Community Interest Company. We set up precisely because we are fed up of our youngsters setting fire to the place, and the group that set fire to the place all had low skills. We, the research we are embedded in is identifying that all, and I mean all of you low level, and we expect it to be about 50% of the population, have pretty much no control over their, all their motor skills, their sound processing and their vision, therefore they can't access learning, and we know that that bottom level don't. So what we want to see is a real agenda for real basic skills development that every child should have achieved by seven, which quite frankly is not in place. And that is, until you address that, nobody can actually develop skills. I know that because I see um, postgraduates, professionals, etc. They're all missing gaps that cause them to be very anxious. I see maths graduates who can't do a 12-piece jigsaw puzzle. Left side arm works with left side, right side works with right. They cannot bring the two sides together. They cannot work over their midline. That tells you they haven't mastered their primitive reflexes. They should have got a two. And I am sorry, but I see a lot of professionals and adults in that position. That is what the UK looks like, and all your kids in the transition year will be in that condition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Carol? Yeah, Carol Willis from the National Foundation for Education and Research. Actually, my question was going to be sent to yours, uh, but I am very depressed and I'm a very glad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an uh, empty person. Let's get up the now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's finish and go to the one. Uh, because it's really important that we sort this out. It's great that HE places have expanded, but we now have more and more people who are going to HE who don't always go on to uh, really well paid jobs. Uh, there's a huge variety of outcomes, and we need a really good alternative technical and professional route for our young people. Uh, and so, um, Jenny, you started to give us some answers, but I'd be really interested to hear about, you know, what do we do? What do we need to do here? You've talked about, you know, the policy being in a, a disarray, and the government are trying to sort it out slowly. Well, how can they help? You've talked about employers um, not being committed uh, withdrawing, um, at, you know, in, in the context of an employment market where people are moving jobs more frequently, you would expect them to invest less in training because they don't reap all the rewards. But what can we do? What are the positive responses? Um, mm. Okay, uh, can we just hang on to that, uh, Bennett? Um, yes. So, what can we do and to, to to frame it in in race uh, race terms? Um, you're not allowed to legislate, but okay. what can you do as a skills minister? You can do an awful lot in our system without legislation, believe you me, if you're Secretary of State. Um, okay, I'm going to have two things. Um, one is a process issue. I think in the long term, if I was Secretary of State, I would want to build collective memory into the policy making mm -hmm. process. If we actually knew what we'd done in the past and why it didn't work, we could have saved ourselves Billions of pounds are yeah. a lot of failed young people's yeah. lives and qualifications they've been given that got abolished the year after they got the qualification. And also some kind of reality check inside the policy process. So Tom's point, dream up a nice policy. There is a challenge function somewhere in Whitehall that actually says, yeah, that's the plan, but here are three reasons why it might not work. We lack a proper challenge. So policy process is one thing. The second thing is a real left field idea, but I think it's one of the things that really marks us out from other countries across the globe that are successful at training, particularly apprenticeship, but also adult skills. We've put the provision of training in the hands of external providers. In most other countries that are good at training, the company's own human resource development function in-house is capable of delivering the and designing the on-the-job elements of apprenticeship and a huge amount of, of structured on-the-job learning. The bulk of learning that we all do as adults in the workplace is structured on-the-job learning. It's not going on a course. 
and there are techniques to do it. But the one bit of the, tra of the skills workforce that the Education and Training Foundation has no mandate over and no funding for is improving the quality of employers' own in-house training workforce. And I really think there are huge gains to be got from concentrating on that and trying to do something about it. Because it would crack apprenticeship and adult learning quite significantly if we could do some things around that. Wow, okay. Um, two, two things that I would do. Um, so when we talk about university degrees route being very established, it's amazing to me that we have so much in the way of poor quality within that route and yet people still don't bat an eyelid at it. But I don't think you're ever going to get to a, any kind of stable system in the, in the skills or apprenticeship space until you start talking about quality. And for those who read my policy exchange report, it was quite funny when I was drafting it uh, for policy exchange. The middle chapter is about where we are now. Where, and I just took as many examples as, of I, uh, as I could of the apprenticeship standards that have been designed and are real and are there. And when the draft of the chapter got to 18,000 words in terms of poor quality standards, they said it's probably time to stop now. I think we've got enough examples. If you have poor quality apprenticeships, people will talk about it. And they will know about it and they will read about it in the newspapers. And when they hear a government minister coming in a couple of years later saying it's all rubbish and we're having to start again, it's, and then another one comes in a few years later and says it's all rubbish, we're starting again. It just seeped into the public consciousness. So this is not good quality. So if I was going to make any changes, I would just do what the Sainsbury Review said the uh, Institute of Technical Education should be doing, or Institute of should be doing, which is clearing out the dross. Because if I clear out the dross, I can at least go to a parent or a, an, an, even a political opponent or a policymaker and say, you know what, I know we haven't finished the job, I know we're not there yet, but what I have here is good. And it's going to get people higher wages and it's going to get them progression but you just don't hear them talking about that. And I know George Osborne stuck the word high quality in front of apprenticeship in every treasury document that he ever produced. <laughs> it just doesn't stick. And so, and quality is perfectly possible now. They had to leave us to do it now, but the will, with the three million targets still in place, it doesn't get talked about very much anymore, as many images, but it's still there. It's still an ambition. Um, goodness knows what a levy's going to do to numbers. The, ironically, a levy is probably going to kill the three million target anyway, but that, that's just by the by. Um, if you don't do quality, you're not going to get anywhere because you're never going to attract the parents who really, really want them. They're the very aspirational side of it. That's nothing to do with uh, what class they're from, what part of the country they are. It's about aspiration. I don't look at that as an aspirational choice for my child, and that's a problem. And the other thing I do is um, I focus on quality, and I just, I just slam the brakes on because every month that passes now, we have apprenticeships going off over there. We have the 16 to 19 seals brand, so this is going to start to drift off over there, and every month that passes, they are just going to get further apart. It is not irretrievable yet. It will be probably within 12 to 18 months now, because once you get the first few T levels there, which are tangibly different, there's no, the different standards, like you said, they're talking about using the same standards. I just don't think it's ever going to work. They're, going to, they're totally different beasts. Different assessments, different standards, it's a different product, it's gone off over there, oh wait, we've now got to start all over again. So I'd slam the brakes on, I'd focus on quality, and that goes back to John, yeah. your point about just yeah. quality, 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 quality. quality. Mm -hmm. you know, when someone asks you, so how, how did it go for your child, you're going to say it was rubbish, and then they're going to go tell someone else it was rubbish. Mm -hmm. They're probably not going to do that about physics A level. You know, I just, I'm not going to, I teach the new A levels, they're a lot more rigorous than they used to be, like they're huge. I'm going to go say to someone, I teach psychology, you know, it is actually better than before. It really is better. It's harder, it's bigger, but it's better than before. And I can say that with my hand and my heart. I'm not going to do that for, for something that is as poor quality. So slam the brakes and worry about quality and you will start to get some movement in the right direction. That's why I take it. Mm -hmm. okay. My two things. One very small thing, one very, probably very, very, very big thing. Uh, first one is change performance tables for schools. Because the minute that you ask school to promote um, apprenticeships or technical, and they can take a look at what they're actually being measured on and continue doing GCSEs. Yeah. Um, very simple thing, if we want to encourage more people in this technical, you need to experience something that is a bit technical. Now, I'm not saying every kid should do D&T GCSE or something of equivalent to that, but they should have the option to be able to do it if that's what they want to do. I spoke um, to a group of uh, design, technology, <coughs> and engineering um, employers 
uh, train providers in schools. And I told them about the skills plan last year when it got published, and they said, well, that's all great, but nobody's going to want to do our route because by the time they've got to 16, they've never experienced it because they've had a diet of EVAC GCSE. They won't know about it, therefore they won't choose it, so they're not going to go down that route. You've already lost them. So my, my first one, my quick one, my easy one, change school performance material measures. Next one is sort of similar to, to Tom's slam the brakes on. We're not at irretrievable <coughs> point. We do, there is, pop, there, there is capacity for policy memory in this process. There is a report sitting within the department that says what went wrong with diploma. Um, there was a lessons learned exercise. There was an awful lot of money spent on it, at very least, and there was an awful lot of money actually spent on what went wrong with it. Um, so I'd press the brakes on apprenticeships and skills plan and get that back out, uh, plus probably a few of the others. Um, intentions of codes and GMBQs, and, which were actually starting to work when they got abolished, which is um, incredibly frustrating. Um, because we don't give anything long enough um, to do, so um, I probably, um, on the flip side, which is what makes it really, really hard, is um, take myself out of the remit as skills minister, because actually I think it being a political decision is what kills him. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, Roger, is it? Um, yeah. Bennett. Um, I think the elephant in the room for me is schools. Right? It's been referred to a couple of times by speakers. That you're trying to build this superstructure of skills training on a failing school system, basically. Failing only in the sense that we're still nowhere near where we need to be, although I really responded you to your point about how far we've come, how brilliantly we've done over the last 30 years. I'd say probably the stats don't exist, but when I became a head teacher in 1996, probably 10% of kids were getting the equivalent of the new level 5, the old B at English and Maths GCSE. This year, 40% nationally are getting the equivalent of the old B grade at English and Maths. But actually, that needs to be 80%. And um, trying to build any sort of high quality technical vocational skills based curriculum on a secondary system that's only providing you with 40% of kids with what in essence is the basic level of literacy and numeracy is bound to fail. You end up either becoming elitist um, and as we've heard from two or three people not providing for those poor kids who have not reached those standards at 16 or you dumb down when we've continually dumbed down over my period in education over the last 30 or 40 years we've continually dumbed down so there's something for those poor kids to do now that's a vicious cycle we've got to continue to break out of it I'm hoping this new um, set of um, uh, achievement criteria this summer will start that new ball game running because we've got to move that 40% who get the old Bs to 80% rapidly. Otherwise this is not going to work, is it? Mm. Um, sorry, can you just hang on a sec? Um, Bennett. <coughs> it, it's only because I'm a contrarian. I'm usually as gloomy as anybody else in these <laughs> meetings. Because I'm a contrarian, I want to be positive about things. <laughs> um, I just want to say, firstly I think to, to you, um, there was a point at which very, very few people knew about the levy. Um, uh, having experienced this in our organisation, it is amazing just how interested you can get when finance tells you a half a million pounds is about to be taken away from you. And you will find that the number of businesses that now do know about it, they're not sure what to do about it afterwards, but the number of businesses who do actually know that they need to do something and do it pretty damn fast, has risen exponentially with the looming horizon of finance telling them they've got this big hole just about to come in, which is not actually linked to anything they do. So that's positive, and it put people's brains in gear. They've gone in very funny directions, I give you that. But it has put their brains in gear. So that, I think, is positive for the future. Um, your, your throwaway line about uh, FE loans and not paying them back, well, fantastic. If it turns out to be a subsidy disguised as a loan, are we that bothered about that? You know, we are increasing the skills of people in areas that need those skills that they're not going to pay back. Well, big deal. Call it, call it, call it a subsidy rather than a loan. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The skills are being delivered. Um, the, the one thing I would say about all of this is, is, is and we've, we've had a lot of discussion about sort of school-based and adults and how they link up and all the rest of it. Um, thinking about 
a very practical thing. Do you know nowhere else in the world calls it vocational education in schools? They call it pre-vocational education. In practically every other jurisdiction in the world, they call it pre-vocational, because that's what it is. It's not vocational. At the age of 16, 14, 18, you're not going to give vocational education. You're going to give pre-vocational education, preparing them for the world of work. So actually, the simplest thing we can do is actually change the name so we actually understand in conversations like this that when we talk about vocational education, we are talking about adults going for uh, whole careers and whole jobs. And pre-vocational education, we are merely preparing the ground. Um, and if we got to that, we might actually get ministers could then actually understand that rather than throwing things around like T-levels and apprenticeships and vocational and all the rest of it, there is actually a cut point which is not about whether you're going that direction or that direction, but at a point at which you stop being, I mean, I think you made this point, it's all going to happen before 19. Yeah. But there is a point at which schooling finishes, and as it were, life prep or work prep starts. Uh, and that might be a, 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 a positive way forward. Thank you. Tim? Thank you. OK, so, I mean, you and you, you have worked with this stuff, I guess. Um, and, and some very nice new stuff in your presentation tonight. I do want to return just to, to a couple of thoughts, which, which weren't in any of the presentations, um, because it's, it's established analysis. Um, and I want to really respond to Rafe's challenge, um, because um, what was in Alison's uh, Wolf's mind when she introduced this dramatically illiberal measure? I, you know, who would have thought that Alison Wolf would say something? Bizarre to to um, so I think partially in my mind was the idea that Christ, as you as you said actually, you know, if you just take the money off them, there'll be enough that's reasonable for us to enable convergence and equality. I think that was, you know, at the heart of it actually, that possibility and hope actually to use your word. Yeah. But what I've heard, and I don't want to be quoted on this, is um, a story of um, crap implementation, actually. So I want to respond to what Rafe said, um, and just return to a couple of points. Um, what, what is true apprenticeship? True apprenticeship is a relationship between a young person and an employer. Mm -hmm. And it's a strong psychological contract, mm -hmm. and it's a strong actual contract. The reason the employer is interested in the relationship is that they are not paying this young person uh, a professional wage. And they will only pay the professional wage when that person has learned the things that are needed for high quality productive processes. And at that point, they're prepared to pay the differential between the training rate and the experienced worker rate. And frankly, we have seen the emergence of that dynamic in certain industries, completely away from any form of government regulation, mm -hmm. restriction, or levy. It, it continues to grow in certain sectors. So my, my response to you, Ray really, is what I would like to see. I'd like to, to be, see the institutions involved, not complained about, but held to account for crap implementation. Where the hell did these standards come from? You know, it's not that there's a shortage of evidence. You know, Chris Winch, Linda Clark's work on the expansive standards which exist just across the water in France, in Germany, which we've known for centuries are vital to employment in areas other than the one for which you've been trained. In other words, true labour market flexibility after training, because you can't predict exactly where the jobs are going to occur. So it is a catalogue of blimey O'Reilly, and you could have anticipated all of this. So what are the individual actors in this artificial system actually up to? They need to be held to account to, for what they've been doing for the last two years. Thank you. OK, let's have some response. Oh, OK. Um. <laughs> doesn't have to go in this order. <laughs> oh, I don't care to kick off. I mean, I think the point about schools is very important. I mean, we have not yet reached the stage where enough people leaving compulsory schooling, now extends to 18, 
achieving what they need to achieve in order to move on to the next stage of their lives, to enter the labour market successfully, and to particularly to train for, for high-level jobs. We've had that problem for a very long time. And although we have made progress, we, you're absolutely correct, we haven't made enough. And we're just going to have to keep chipping away at it. But I think there's another problem with schools, and that is that they're rational actors. And if I was the head teacher of a school, uh, looking at how I was judged, and I had my own sixth form, then frankly, what I'm going to do when I, the kids re re reach the age of 16 is my school is going to be very selective. I'm going to keep the kids I think are going to do a score well at A level, and I'm going to dump the drops, and then they're going to go somewhere else. And where they usually go is the FE college, where they then have to be remediated. Um, and I don't think that's a good system. And I do think there is a major problem that, in a way, A level is the default route for the kids who've done relatively well, and we still see the vocational as the route for those who didn't do so well and the sort of re-inclusion, re-motivation. There's an element of truth behind that model about the re-motivation, possibly if it's done well, mm -hmm. but it's still not, not an adequate model. And I worry that the T-levels will simply enshrine that if we're not careful. The transition year certainly will. If you get put on the transition year, you're not going to transition to anything too jolly, I suspect. <laughs> In terms of the levy, yeah, the levy hasn't been done very well. And I think the problem was that whatever Alison thought it was going to be, the Treasury just saw it as magic money. Hey, okay. yeah, it's like, a, yeah. yeah, it's not our money. Maybe we just, we just save some money. But of course, what people didn't get their heads around is that when we had industrial training boards in the levy 35 years ago, 40 years ago, we didn't have the collection of providers that we now have who can help employers to navigate the system in ways that are economically rational but possibly not what policymakers wanted. So I, this time last year I was at an after conference panel session for the Association of Business Schools and they were ecstatic. Okay. Christmas had just come early that year. They were already gearing up for their MBA offer. They were going to every big company who's got currently got a graduate training scheme saying, you levy, it's an MBA. Yeah. And that's what will happen. Now, that's, I don't think what, certainly not what the Richard Review intended for the apprenticeship. I don't think it's what ministers intended, but it's the problem that people want their money back, and this is the easiest way to get it. So I do think there are, some of the incentives are quite perverse. As for holding people to account, well, it's interesting that no one wants the job of being the, um, the chief exec of our uh, Institute for Apprenticeship. I, I can't imagine <laughs> one. <laughs> I think that in the end they'll have to get a foreigner who doesn't know what they're letting themselves <laughs> about. Because, yes, there will be someone held to account, and I'm willing to make a bet that when, when somebody has to get in front of the Public Accounts Committee, when someone has to take the public blame for things not having worked out as planned, I fate is going to be the body that takes the heat. And that's the problem. That it's easy to have sacrificial victims, but it doesn't solve the problem. And the fact that there is, and I think Mark was probably, no, no, Tom was probably right, there probably won't be a fight. Everyone else will just say, well, it's them, it's them, they've got it sorted out. Everyone, the buck will get passed beautifully, uh, and there will be no clarity. Yep. And that's the difficulty, and I don't see in our system who really owns the problem. And if no one owns the problem, it won't get solved. Yes. Okay. Interesting, I looked on the website again, just to check, and, and in France, it's unbelievably clear mm. whose fault this would be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the duties of all of the actors yep. are very, very yes. strongly stated in law. Yes. Mm. There is a glorious document um, produced by the Department of Education that describes um, the responsibilities for the apprenticeship program. Um, what sits with the IFA, what sits with the department, <laughs> what sits with the SFA, what sits with Ofsted and what sits with Ofqual. I challenge any of you to read it not once at your wrist. Um, it's an incredibly unclear statement of who is responsible for any of these parts. I'd love to hold somebody to account to him. I think the problem is that the people that you'd want to hold to account have probably moved on. Um, and the ones that are left pass the buck and said, oh, yes, that's the responsibility of people we've replaced. We're going to do it better this time. 
um, which is the answer, to be fair, that I have been given on occasion. Um, well, we've, we're, we're going to learn. We're going to do it differently. We've been given this challenge and we're going to make it better. Um, but without learning from what's gone before. So I'm not really sure how they intend to do it, except that they're confident in their own ability uh, to do it, or that they're confident in their own ability to have moved to a different job before something comes back to hold them to account. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to just build on, build on you as well. I mean, Tim, your, your question of what is an apprenticeship is a really good question. And you would think at some point yeah. during the last five years that the government had really just settled this very clearly. And if you go back and look at the rich review, there was getting there, not quite there, we got, got something out there. But actually, um, it was, so with my policy exchange document, the first section was the history of the reform so far. And if you look at it, they did, the government didn't publish. They did publish a definition of the question. And it was a terrible definition. Absolutely terrible. It was essentially <laughs> any job with training yeah. Yeah. could be an apprenticeship. A, a really good example is occupational. We talked about job versus occupation. Now, this is not something I'm an expert in. But they put the word, they said that any apprenticeship, the government says very clearly, that any apprenticeship must be in a recognised occupation. But at no point did they define what an occupation was. UKCS would potentially tried to help. They just weren't. They were kept at arm's end. This is this is. So they kept. And every time, if you ask the minister now, if it was a written question or anything like that, they would come up with that same definition five years later, and it just wasn't good enough. And um, we tried in my policy change report to try and put a, a clearer statement in their building on what the uh, OECD and various others said. We tried to tighten that up. Because that's the third, because that in itself would sweep away a lot of the, the draws even without having to do anything else, just make it a better definition. Yeah. Um, but going back to your point about implementation, one of the biggest flaws of the programme is that it never set any objectives. So civil servants put these things in place, we're going to do these things, but we're not going to give you the tools to hold us to account for whether we actually achieve them or not. So the, the, the vaguer the objectives, the objectives in inverted commas, the vaguer they were, the easier it was for them to basically do anything that they, they really felt at any time was relevant. And so you look at a three million target, that came way after the reform. Now, if that was an objective, fine, put it in place at the beginning and go and deliver. At least everyone knows what's happening. That came in several years later, and then they still claim an equality as an objective, but of course that doesn't match with a three million target at all. And so it's basic program management. And if you look at it, it's anything other than entirely basic, set clear objectives, get all the actors in the system to agree to them, and then set uh, time scales, clear responsibilities, put them in place. Yeah. It's not rocket, I'm not a program management expert, but I know it's really, to get some basics would get you a long way there. Yeah. It hasn't happened, it is not happening. I don't think in the, the, they're onto their fifth director of the apprenticeship reforms yeah. now. They go through every couple of years on average. Um, the, the, uh, the next one will probably come in and stay for a couple of years and probably we'll something else, and they will not want to be held for account for things that their predecessors did, etc., etc. So without any clear objective for the program, still without even a respectable definition of an apprenticeship, I just find it very hard to see how it's going to get better. We could maybe steady the ship, but getting better, I, I can't see it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I think um, that um, we should make sure that you all get something to drink and eat before we go. Um, <laughs> you may need it. I think, I think we all do, to be quite honest. <laughs> Golly. Um, I just wonder whether Alan uh, would like to say a few, uh, make a few remarks. Yes, if I may. Please, yes, please do. Thanks yeah. so much, James. Oh, first of all, can I just thank the, mm. the panel and the yes. year for the presentation. Um, I knew we were going to be in for a fun time when I saw the slides that you sent through, <laughs> and uh, thank you for setting us off on that, uh, on that note. I think, um, you know, as a chief executive of awarding or two awarding organisations and a tech ed company that's involved in the middle of all of this, all of those perspectives that everybody in the audience and from the panel has put forward are ones that I wholeheartedly recognise, and especially this debate between quality and quantity. Um, you know, look, I've got, I've got 8,000 <coughs> learners doing general applied qualifications. W what happens? once those kids have got those qualifications, what value are we going to place on the future? We had it with the 14 to 19 diplomas. That was stopped as well. We haven't got those qualifications that are in, in, in apprenticeships. You know, that stability that we're asking for the system, 65 secretaries of state for skills and employability in 30 years. 65 secretaries of state. <coughs> 11 machinery of government changes. 
it's just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And by the, and, you know, in comparison, we've had 19 schools ministers, 19 HE ministers. So you can see just where this is um, not a stable system. So I think there are some challenges in there. I haven't got the answers. We're just part of the part of the, the group that's trying to get some of the um, the, the responses that are, that the system is demanding. But I do think this this point that that both you and and um, also Mark was making about some of the people that are being impacted by this lack of clarity, the social mobility point, the impact disproportionately on poor communities and on people from from minority ethnic communities are it is absolutely not what we should be doing. So. Thank you for the um, response. I've, I've also to, to thank you, James, as well, to uh, allow us to sponsor tonight's event and the previous event that we had to, on this theme. I think you can see by the interaction with the um, audience, I think it's been a really interesting evening. Mm -hmm. But thank you also, yes. all three of you, thank for you. all the work that you've done in all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Tom, thank you, Gemma, uh, Mark in his absence, and, uh, and thank you all.